Professor Camilla Naidu, Executive Dean, Faculty of Humanities. Professor Ronit Frankel, our inductee tonight. Professor Skumbuzo Mgadi, Head of English Department of the University of Johannesburg, Director of Center for Ecological Intelligence. Senior leaders of the university, members of CNET, and other academics, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Sanibonan, Huyanant, good evening, Tobel, Lokovera. It is indeed a great honor and special privilege for me to welcome you to the professorial inaugural lecture of Professor Ronit Frankel. As I do so, I wish to express a warm welcome to her loved ones, special guests, and her colleagues. This is indeed a proud and joyful, yet a landmark moment for all of you, for Professor Frankel, and of course for us here at UJ and higher education in South Africa and beyond. The inauguration of professors is a public ceremony in which newly appointed professors are inducted into office by the vice chancellor and deliver their inaugural addresses. The ceremony has its roots in the medieval university and serves multiple purposes. Firstly, it is an expression of welcome and an entry for new professors, joining the circle of colleagues who are already professors. Secondly, it provides a platform for the professors to display their expertise in the discipline and showcase their research. Today we gather to bear witness to the entry of Professor Frankel to the illustrious community of scholars at the university. It is a celebration of the contribution to the discipline and ultimately the impact on society. Professors provide the university with its identity, its character, academic legitimacy, and its integrity. The inaugural lecture is a rite of passage following the confirmation of the appointment of the person as a professor. This evening we will listen to Professor Frankel as the gown goes to town. By this I mean that the power of the inaugural address is when the expertise is showcased beyond the corridors of the university and reverberates with society. Today stands out as a moment of pride for the incumbent, the family, fellow scholars, the university, and ultimately society. Edward Said, in an article on defiance and taking position, offers a formulation of the ideal role of the true intellectual. And I quote, one who commands a vast knowledge of his or her discipline, who is rigorous in the analysis of literature, who views being an intellectual as a vocation, the intellectual who considers it necessary to step in the public sphere and to speak truth to power, namely to question, interpret, and understand authority rather than consolidating it, to step out of the boundaries of the academy to connect oneself, to affiliate oneself, to align oneself, with an ongoing process or contest of some sort, perhaps with the aim of improving the lot of the oppressed. The intellectual who functions as a kind of public memory to recall what is forgotten or ignored, to make the connections that are otherwise hidden, to provide alternatives for mistaken policies, close quote. It remains then for us as a university with a pan-African vision to derive our mandate as intellectuals and as professors. How do we embrace the role of a professor as a disruptor 
while continuing to be flagship careers of our disciplines. This evening we will listen to Professor Frankel as one further step in the journey of being a professor. This is a journey which does not culminate once this lecture has been given. It is a self-reflective pause in the journey of the professor with a promise of more to enrich our minds and simultaneously contributing to the rich intellectual body of work in the discipline. Let me now invite the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Humanities, Professor Camila Naidu, to introduce Professor Freckle to us. Professor Naidu. Good evening, San Benan, Dumelang, Khoyanant, Vice Chancellor, Dr. Ralipata, and guests of honor. I now have the pleasure of reading the CV of Professor Ronette Frankel. Ronette Frankel completed her BA honors and master's degrees in African literature at the University of the Witwatersrand. She holds a PhD in comparative cultural and literary studies from the University of Arizona with a minor in women's studies. She was a postdoctoral fellow under the supervision of Prof. Isabel Hofmeyer in the Department of African Literature at Wits before being appointed as a lecturer in the Department of English at the University of Johannesburg at the end of 2006. Over the last 16 years, Renette has moved through the ranks from lecturer to senior lecturer to associate professor to full professor. She has published over 20 peer-reviewed articles, six peer-reviewed book chapters, and two books. Her monograph entitled Reconsiderations, South African Indian Fiction and the Making of Race in Postcolonial Culture was the first full-length academic study of South African Indian literature in the world. Her second book, Traversing Transnationalism, The Horizons of Literary and Cultural Studies, was co-edited with Pierre Paolo Frasinelli from the University of Johannesburg and David Watson at Uppsala University in Sweden. She has been invited to be the guest editor of three tier one international journals and three local special editions of journals. Renette has delivered papers at almost 30 conferences around the globe, including several keynote addresses. She has supervised three doctoral and four master students to completion and is currently supervising three doctoral and two master students. She has been the postdoctoral supervisor of five students and has one postdoc currently. Renette has served on the University of Johannesburg's Research Committee and the Teaching and Learning Committee in the Faculty of Humanities. She has been a member of the National Research Foundation's Specialist Assessment Panel for Ratings in Literature, Languages and Linguistics since 2019. She also sits on the South African government's Department of Education's Assessment Panel for Creative Outputs. She's currently the external examiner for both the University of Cape Town's graduate program in English and the University of Eswatini's English program. Ronette is editor of the University of Johannesburg's flagship African studies journal, The Thinker. The University of Johannesburg acquired The Thinker in April 2019 from Dr. Isup Pahad. As the managing editor, Renette has successfully converted the journal into an accredited pan-African focused academic journal, which is published quarterly. Renette has research and teaching interests in African literatures, race, gender, and sexuality studies, cultural studies, post-colonial literature and theory, African studies, and Indian diasporic literatures. We wish Renette Frankel well and look forward to an inaugural lecture today. Congratulations, Renette, on this great achievement. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being with me today. <coughs> either online in the time of COVID or in person in the room. 
As an inaugural talk is traditionally a retrospective of one's work, I would like to begin today with thanks. Um, and firstly, I'd, I would like to pay homage to the four extraordinary scholars who have shaped me as an academic. <coughs> I was privileged to complete my first three degrees at WITS in the Department of African Literature with three very gifted teachers and talented academics, Isabel Hofmeyer, James Agudi, and Becky Zizwe Peterson. The way I think, the way I teach, and the way I understand the world of ideas as an Africanist was very much shaped by these scholars and the culture that they created in that department on the most fundamental of levels. My PhD was completed under the guidance of Laura Briggs, who is now at UMass Amherst. Laura taught me how to think about African intellectual production in both global and intersectional terms while also modeling how a feminist intellectual should interact with people and institutions that need transformation. These lessons were invaluable in shaping my academic life. I would also like to thank my colleagues at the University of Johannesburg and my head of department, Sikambuzo Mgadi, for creating such a nice environment to work in. I've been extremely lucky to have strong family support and strong roots. My wonderful husband, Jason, my sons, Alex and Liam, the Feynman clan have walked this path with me in different ways. But in particular, I would like to thank my father, Lester Feynman, who supported every choice I made and was, in retrospect, a pioneer in gender neutral child rearing. He unfortunately cannot be with us tonight, but I'm sure that he's watching very impatiently from his balcony on the world, eager for me to start this retrospective on the stand, strands that connect my work together. Thank you. So my work falls at the intersection of African literature and cultural studies. The title of this talk is Global African Literature as it reflects my focus on African and African diasporic cultural production and the critical cultural theory that frames it. In its most basic form, I position African cultural production as the lens through which to understand itself and the globe, be it the global north or the global south. Raymond Williams, many years ago, came up with the idea of using keywords as a methodology to, to interrogate culture and society as forms of interrelated meaning, or really as a set of terms that are critical to understanding the modern world. I am applying his concept of keywords to my own body of work as a sort of a roadmap of intersecting main ideas. The key words that are useful in mapping the connections in my work are Africa, as most of my work has uh, focused on African or African diasporic literature, identity, as most of my scholarship examines issues of race, gender, and sexuality, global or transnational connectivity, as cultural production like literature is of a place and time in both local and global contexts which determine meaning. And finally, what I'm calling the other narrative, because as someone trained in cultural studies, I look for both the patterns across things as well as the pattern in the silences across things, as what is not articulated can tell us as much as what is. Much of my work is fo focused on these gaps or silences. But much like William's original intention behind key words, each of the key words used here are methodology to interrogate cultural theory and literature as interrelated forms. <coughs> 
In the trajectory I'm tracing today, I will discuss one piece of work with each key word that I've identified, but that represents my work in that area as a whole. My first book, Reconsiderations, investigated South African Indian fiction in order to examine how this literature gives rise to new ways of thinking about South African culture and post-colonial theory. The dramatic changes that South Africa experienced after liberation prompted fresh ways of understanding its cultural history, which moved beyond ideas based on difference into ideas based on integrated forms. South African Indian fiction offers a different lens through which to view the tangled and complex forms of interdependency that mark both South African and global cultures more broadly. I read this fiction as a model for culturally integrated cultural formation. Instead of focusing on ideas of embodiment and different, this fiction pivots on the conception of race as a social category shaped by its historical roots. South African Indian fiction explores the movements of Indians to South Africa during the 19th century, covering issues of migration, diaspora, transnationalism, hybridity, difference, and a blurring of boundaries in post-apartheid fiction. I argue that these narratives focus on the tension between race, place, and history in a South African and transnational context in a way that suggests revisions to post-colonial theory. Reading post-colonial South African Indian fiction as a model for an intellectually integrated cultural modality reveals the shifts in both South African and transnational cultures. This conceptual negotiation between national and transnational sites highlights shifting patterns of culture within an increasingly globalized post-colonial world. The process of dissemination of people and ideas through such roots can be interrogated through a relational understanding of cultural forms, where the specificity of the critical perspectives offered by non-normative narratives of South African Indian fiction are important indicators of where discourses of power reside. And it is out of this consideration of global circuitry that my interest in transnationalism emerged. Sorry about that. Traversing transnationalism, the horizons of literary and cultural studies, was uh, my next study. While the concept of transnationalism was becoming more prominent in literary and cultural studies at the time, it ran the risk of framing the transnational as an extension of the West with its exclusionary political and cultural forms. Traversing transnationalism brought to light overlooked, marginalized, and minor transnational configurations within the Southern Hemisphere in general and in and within Africa in particular, holding the potential to offer alternatives to a homogenous account of transnational connectivity. This interdisciplinary collection has a broad scope by design. It engages directly with a variety of literary and non-literary texts, socio-cultural configurations, and urgent political and theoretical dilemmas in its search for still unexplored transnational possibilities. There's a strong link here to both the other narrative and Africa, as the focus in this collection is both on marginalized transnational configurations and the global south. The key word global also refers to my positioning of African cultural production as a global lens of understanding that offers us the other narrative on a variety of constructs, including questions of identity. A recent special edition of the journal Feminist Theory called Chicklet in a Time of African Cosmopolitan, which are completed with Pamela Gupta, utilized concepts of identity, place, and theoretical revision to centralize African cultural production at the heart of popular fiction. 
Chiclet as a genre is very much in dynamic formation across Africa. It deals with changing notions of femininity and feminism as tied to categories of gender, race, ethnicity, class, sex, sexuality, age, consumerism, the impact of new media on the genre, the pleasures of reading, new circuits of mobility afforded to African female protagonists, the autobiographical style and the substance of chiclet writers themselves, and finally, border discourses of African cosmopolitanism in relation to character, affect, and setting. The scholarship attempts to move the genre of chiclet beyond its Anglo-American origins and give it landscape, texture, color, and affect by engaging the growing number of chiclet writers and novels based in and on the African continent. Also bringing South Africa into conversation with larger continental and diasporic circuits. This moves beyond the potential to speak back in a post-colonial sense through diverse African case studies in order to recenter and revi revive the debate from and on Africa itself. This project has a strong relationship to the next category, which is the other narrative. In all areas of thought, some ideas are dominant, yet there's always another narrative, even in hegemonic configurations. Sometimes these ideas enhance hegemonic ones, sometimes they contest them. Regardless, they reveal a different layer, either by tracking a new pattern of ideas or by reading the silences within them. It is this other narrative that in interests me the most and forms the last key word and the one that I would like to really concentrate on today. Many scholars, myself included, have examined the patterns in post-apartheid literary studies, either as shifts in form or focus, such as theorizations of transitional or post-transitional literary studies that characterize uh, literature after apartheid, more recent conceptualizations have looked at South African literary studies as being dominated by dystopian narratives or as exhibiting a strong sense of betrayal in terms of the present. I am more interested here in a different trajectory altogether that recasts both of these strands of thought and can be linked to the work of Njibulo and Debeli. Exploring the ordinary has been a central concern in South African literary studies since Indebele's formative call for the rediscovery of the ordinary in literary representation. The ordinary or everyday relies on the lived experience of time, on temporal temporalities defined as the way we experience and imagine um, the past, present, and future. My central argument across a number of works is about how the lived experience of a systemic shift, which is an ordinary experience in post-apartheid South Africa, coupled with the utopian ideals that attended the liberation movement, has shaped South African temporalities in ways that endure. It is within this framework of how we imagine and experience temporal temporality that I read post-apartheid fiction as a type of cultural history. As dystopian texts have also proliferated globally, the impact of viewing this global form through a South African lens offers us a shift in perspective more broadly. I argue that numerous texts articulate post-apartheid temporalities as a type of post-liberation consciousness or afterlife born out of a successful political re regime change in South Africa. In much the same way that apartheid prejudice did not disappear after independence, nor did the inclusive ideologies of the broad-based utopian anti-apartheid or liberation movement. By afterlives, I mean how certain aspects of the past reside in the present, and specifically 
how the utop utopian discourses that shaped the anti-apartheid resistance movements live on in current post-apartheid fiction. It is in this sense that what is sometimes seen as dystopian is recast as a form of optimism that can be read as an application of Ernst Bloch's practice of ideological criticism, which is able to dis discern utopian dimensions in cultural ideas or constructions, such as literature. My most recent work, and probably the last on this topic, traces patterns and silences in South African literary studies after the Marikana massacre, revealing the ambiguous operational logic that I argue characterizes South Africa, facilitating the utopian with the dystopian, the personal with the political, silence with vocalization, success with failure within a cultural framework that an Njibulo and Njibulo Ndebele characterized as having dislocation at the heart of its structure. My focus is on historical hauntings and ghostly silences in literature here. In a context of accelerated change, both, both locally and globally, literary patterns and trends must necessarily reflect changing cultural configurations, both inside and outside borders, because quite simply, context determines meaning. Linking South African literary studies nomenclature to historical events such as Marikana allows for historical currents to be foregrounded and traced in cultural art artifacts more explicitly. Historically, the Marikana Mine Massacre of 2012 was an important turning point in South Africa, and I believe forms a rapture in the national imaginary. This was the first time in South Africa's history after independence in which the state had been the perpetrator of a massacre. I am not making an argument for equivalences or comparisons here, but I'm rather trying to centralize the specter of state violence in South Africa's cultural imaginary as a way to articulate how frightening it is for its population and the relationship between that fear and rupture. I'm essentially using a historical rupture as a way to articulate the hauntings of ordinary South African life and its representations. The question is then what kinds of narratives are shaping South Africa post-2012? What narratives do we currently have that can, that can adequately make sense of this shifting context where old nomenclature is inadequate? Can we think through literary texts that reflect the nuances of the presence, present better? The transnational term, turn in global literary studies has resulted in many South African writers setting their works outside of the country's borders altogether or forming dialogues with broader contexts in ways that need exploring. For example, in King Muleli's novel Pleasure examines notions of pleasure in a transnational historical frame and has become a contemporary masterpiece of fiction globally. Zaxim Dyer's Rachel's Blue is set in the US where the after effects of a successful civil rights struggle in South Africa is understood globally as a lens through which to view other oppressions. Lauren Bukas's novel Broken Monsters is set in Detroit, is part thriller, part serial killer detective story, part city love novel, and part modern tome to new forms woven together, resulting in an extraordinary mediation on global popular culture transnational histories of race and the destabilization of the specificities of place. The cultural history mapped by these literary texts reveals the circuitry between African literature and global considerations. There have been important interventions in South African literary studies which offer new modalities for understanding its cultural production. Rebecca Duncan, for instance, looks at the concept of the Gothic in the, concept, 
context of a South Africa unmaking and reshaping itself and sees the Gothic as emerging as a language for long suppressed histories of violence, for ongoing experiences at odds with utopian images of the new democracy. While contemporary literary forms such as specul speculative fictions that are found in Gothic literatures are very different to the realist mode of writing found in earliest texts, this history of thematic concerns forms a tapestry of interconnected narratives that makes up the body of South African literary histories of the present. The past continues to shape the present in a variety of ways. There's been an expectation by South Africans that our post-apartheid government would deliver on its liberation discourse promises in all its forms. While South Africa has transi transitioned into a multi-party democracy post-apartheid, the country is also characterized by the failures that have attended its successes. For many South Africans, this democracy, democracy falls short of the utopian promises of the liberation struggle that undergirded it and is therefore insufficient. This is not so much a betrayal as some theorists have posited, posited but is more about falling outside of the utopian ideals of a complete equitable systemic overhaul rather than the imperfect systemic change that has occurred. This is perhaps what Jacob Lamini has questioned as being a successful civil rights struggle rather than a revolution. A crucial distinction in understanding the country and its cultural production today. What has survived across temporalities is the embedded attachment to or internalization of the ideals that bound the anti-apartheid struggle together and continue into the present in terms of widespread expectations that a better life is a fundamental human right, a post-liberation consciousness or afterlife that has retained utopian, and utopian ideals at its core. Poetry collections like Sindiswa Busuku's Loud, Loud and Yellow Laughter or Khabiba Badaroon's The History of Intimacy weave lines between ordinary affective personal economies and the desire for more on a broader scale that muddies the personal and political. <coughs> Alternatively, works like Hunger Eats a Man by Nkwesinati Satoli or Lesekho Rampolo King's Bergmank setting articulate the material and effective cost of poverty on black bodies, reminding us that post-apartheid has not meant post-inequality, a crucial distinction that centralizes failure while it highlights the success of independence. This relationality between success and failure, local and global, local and global, dystopian and utopian, is for me indicative of South African culture and literature. If South Africa is characterized by an ambiguous operational logic at its core, the theorist who can make sense for, of this for us is Njibolo and Debeli, whose oeuvre articulates and has articulated this idea as a mode of understanding linking past and present. Ndebele sees South Africa as having, and I quote, an intriguing, sorry, South Africans as having an intriguing capacity to be disarmingly kind and hospitable at the same time as they are capable of the most horrifying cruelty, end, co end quote. This bifurcated structure and th of thinking and feeling, I argue, is born out of a long history of trauma and racial oppression that still resonates today. Tando and Giovanni cent centralizes trauma as the defining feature of the country and asks, to what extent has South Africa and have South Africans failed to address the aftermath of apartheid, the resonances of what can be felt to this day? To what extent, he asks, are we living in a post-traumatic space? 
in centralizing affective trauma from both historical and present realities. And Giovanni highlights how the degrad degradation of poverty that is still mostly racially marked results in the ambiguous, ambiguous operational logic of South Africa's collective cultural imaginary that Underbelly sees. It is also a reminder of the importance of Fanon and his link between the political and the psychological in the context of colonial traumas carried into the present through apartheid's legacies. <clears throat> apartheid has been characterized as a type of internal colonialism, which followed on the heels of Dutch and British, British colonialism, respectively. Fanon described the colonial world as being Manichaean in nature, characterized by false dualism dualisms such as good and bad, black and white, etc. Similarly, apartheid discourse was underpinned by such bifurcated logic. The connection between colonialism and apartheid thought creates a trajectory based on the violence of Manichaean characterizations, which were muddied at the end of apartheid, but which linger in its post-apartheid afterlife. And it is the same ambiguous operational logic that characterizes South African literary production after Americana. Chris Thurman has examined the absence of images of mines or mining in literature post 2012, centralizing Americana in his reading. He says, and I quote, what is it that has caused this curious lacuna when it comes to representations of mining and fiction. I will suggest that the cause lies, at least in part, in a combination of South African fiction's ongoing wrestle with realism and the impact of a central traumatic rupture in the national imaginary, the Marikana massacre." End quote. On some level then, this absence in representation reveals a lot about the event and its traumatic aftermath a trauma that is beyond representation at present. It seems like the possibilities of the imagination has, have failed us with Marikana as an event out of time, in a sense. Following Althusser's idea of reading for silences, this lacuna in representation speaks quite loudly. While there has been much debate and critique about the Marikana massacre in public cultures, Mines and Marikana seem to be unrepresentable in literary cultures. If literary representation has rediscovered the ordinary in different ways post-independence, and images of mining form a lacuna in literary representation after Marikana, the silence can be read as falling outside of represent representability because it cannot be framed by the spectacular forms in its historical cultural repertoire that characterized writing under apartheid in this changed context. Yet it is certainly not an event that is ordinary in any way. South African literary representations, quite simply, do not seem to have the tools to write about Americana as of yet, even in conceptual conceptualizations that situate the ordinary and the spectacular on a continuum. This returns me to Indebelli and his questioning of whether dislocation lies at the heart of structures of thinking and feeling in South Africa when he asks, and I quote, how is the growth of the imagination or the nurturing of human sensibility been affected by the dramatic oscillation between extremes in South Africa, end quote. It seems that it lies, it lies in reading the silences along with the vocalizations of the present. The relationship between the ordinary and the spectacular that Indebelli famously theorized in the 1980s still has resonance to post marikana South Africa for a number of other reasons. He defined the spectacular as a type of content over form genre of representation. In order, to, in order to communicate the spectacular ugliness of apartheid, 
with emphasis placed on exterioritary and the ordinary texture of, li texture of life ignored in favor of its message. The ordinary, conversely, focuses on interiority and the e everyday, and barely says, and I quote, by rediscovering the ordinary, the stories remind, remind us necessarily that the problems of the South African social formation are complex and all-embracing. They cannot be reduced to a single, simple formulation, end quote. Literary production shifted to this rediscovery of the ordinary post-independence, with narratives continuing to emerge today that articulate the texture of everyday life in different ways. Jenny Bozina Dupree applies this concept to erotic LGBTQI writing in South Africa, and she says, I quote, with this spectacular context in mind, to rediscover the erotic as ordinary particularly for black lesbian women, could be to focus on the interior lives and desires of the characters and on details that refuse reduction to stereotype. Here the erotic is understood as an integrative force which contests the ways in which sexist and racist discourses about, about black women seek to reduce them to their bodies and transform those bodies into sexual objects with no desires of their own. In other words, it could be seen to context, contest spectacularization, end quote. Dupree reads the ordinary as a type of empowering mechanism to counteract the spectacularization of stereotype that still plagues oppressed groups like the LGBTQI community in an innovative contemporary reading of Indebelli. Tsitsi Jaji situates the practice of reading and writing post-independent South Africa over the past two decades as enabling what she calls the rediscovery of the ordinariness of belonging to Africa in opposition to the paradigm of South African exceptionalism. Pumla Danea Gokola reads post-independent South Africa as relating to Indebelli's famous explication of the relationship between the spectacular and the ordinary, where the space of the spectacular, she says, has moved away from the literary to the explicitly political sphere. These examples illustrate the breadth and depth of the application of this paradigm. While the paradigm does rely on bifurcated either or logical underpinnings, it is useful in revealing the historical circuits that overlay the present. Examining literary patterns in South African literary studies after Marikana then reveals an ambiguous operational logic that encompasses the utopian with the dystopian, the personal with the political, silence with vocalization, success with failure, within a framework that Indebelli characterized as, dis as having dislocation at the heart of its structure of thinking and feeling. This framework is constantly in dialogue with from what is before, where the specter of the past continues to haunt the present, and where the present is no longer transitioning. I think this sort of theorization helps us to understand South African literary production in the context of a global African his history shaped by the past. But it, of course, also beg begs the question of how reading the rest of the world from the perspective of global African literature changes those configurations too. Thank you. <laughs>
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Rolid, for this very insightful and very complex uh, presentation. And I have to think on my feet um, and uh, be able to respond uh, to this very uh, interesting paper. Um, uh, last night, I was reading um, a chapter from uh, Theodore Adorno's book, uh, uh, called How Can We Leave After Auschwitz? And uh, the chapter was the question of working through the past. And in that chapter, he begins by saying that uh, one wants to forget the past, rightly because nothing can live in its shadow, wrongly because it continues to live after us. And he was writing against or in the wake of uh, the Nazi rule in Germany and its terror. And how do we live after that event? And Professor Frankel has looked at the different ways in which African literature has lived through the past and is living through the present. And what is important, of course, is that um, she has focused on not only what we read, but also what we don't read, what we don't see in this literature. In other words, the way in which this literature is grappling, is groping towards something which is perpetually elusive. So in what ways has African literature and South African literature been global? And of course, we know that the movement of global, uh, or the, 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 the movements of culture globally uh, go back to the time when, and I'm talking here about South African literature, to the time when writers had to locate or relocate to the West, to the Americas, to, to England, uh, to France. We can remember, for example, the artists and writers, Gerald Sicotto settled in France. Uh, we remember uh, Louis Ngozi, um, uh, who came back to South Africa. Others never came back. Gerald Sicotto, for example, came back uh, as deceased, and Louis Ngozi uh, died in South Africa. But what we do know is that uh, South African literature has a long history of globalization. In fact, uh, at some point, South African literature was absent from South Africa. So in that sense, what I think is important about this talk is that it raises that question of where certain literatures were and how current forms uh, have sought to speak for those uh, absences, that long history of, of absence, but also uh, that this current literature is beginning to look for those networks uh, that uh, would have been lost. And I think that uh, framing uh, this talk uh, by using Raymond Williams's uh, keywords is important for a number of reasons that what it does is uh, it, it, it traces patterns uh, so that uh, what we see today, because it is almost impossible uh, to see the present in the form of a pattern or the present in the form of what uh, is already completed, but by situating um, the talk uh, in what she calls uh, keywords, uh, one begins to see these patterns even in what may seem uh, to be a very chaotic uh, present. And these patterns are um, identity, in other words, how uh, South African literature in the present uh, reconstitutes that concept of identity, uh, identity being, uh, being uh, race, uh, being gender, being so uh, sexuality, how South African literature has dealt with uh, the tension, which is an old tension between the local and the global, and I think that it is an important aspect of, of not just uh, South African literature today, but 
uh, of the history of, of African literature uh, broadly. And here uh, we are looking at uh, the generations of African literature beginning, uh, beginning with uh, uh, the migrations of cultural capital uh, from, uh, you know, from the south to the north, uh, the, the period of, uh, of decolonization, of exile, and of return. So we are looking at here how South African literature has encountered these questions of home, of world, uh, and of return. And she has also raised the questions of, uh, of other narratives, uh, that is, um, uh, those narratives that uh, uh, raise uh, questions that uh, uh, bring us to uh, the question that I started with, that is how to think through uh, African literature, uh, but also those literatures that force us, such as Indian literature, uh, to look at the dislocations of such questions as, as identity, as, as race, and so on, by their very searching uh, uh, modalities, in other words, the way in which uh, uh, certain literatures, um, like Indian literature, uh, cannot very uh, cannot neatly be located uh, within a specific uh, category, uh, such as South African literature, such as uh, Indian literature, uh, such as white, such as black, such as. Um, colored writing, it is a literature that is uh, it's in the middle, that is in between, and that searches for, uh, uh, or that is in perpetual search uh, for, for identity. Uh, so in that sense, uh, what we have, as, as, as uh, Ronit pointed out, what we have uh, in South African literature uh, is, a, is, is a global literature within a local literature, uh, so that we begin to uh, wonder about uh, these, uh, these terms, uh, such as uh, the local and the global when in fact uh, what we have in South African literature is a history of, of migrations. We have a history of immigrations. We have uh, the migrations from the West Indies. We have migrations from, uh, from India. We have migrations from the West. We have migrations from Brazil. In other words, South African literature has developed out of those migrations in, so that Af South African literature uh, may not uh, in the end be able to claim uh, a fixed identity. And that is what I picked up from, uh, from, Ronit's, uh, from Ronit's interest and, the way of and, and of course the way in which uh, she conceptualizes uh, issues of transnationalism, that they have a long history uh, in South Africa and, they are pr and, and the present uh, is, is, is simply a place when, uh, when, when transnationalism uh, is beginning to, uh, to find a deeper expression. And that we are indeed surprised sometimes by the way in which um, uh, what we consider uh, to be identity may in fact uh, be uh, more uh, of what we don't say, more of a silence than, uh, than what we, we actually uh, say. And within that nexus, uh, she speaks about uh, marginal or marginalized uh, literatures, uh, literatures that we may not have, uh, have read. Uh, and I remember last week, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Neville Chunu, uh, speaking about uh, someone who, um, someone he encountered, uh, you know, in the streets and who opened uh, his boot, the boot of his car, which was full of books that he had published himself and books that are totally unknown uh, in, well, unknown by us who are interested in, uh, in literature, but which, which exist uh, and mark a certain uh, time and mark a certain idea uh, of being, of, of individuality, uh, of personality. Uh, and uh, the talk also spoke about uh, uh, other, um, uh, other silences, uh, that is silences between oppositions, such as uh, silences between what is uh, considered uh, the present and what is considered the past, what is considered uh, utopian, what is considered dystopian. And, and, and Ronit uh, argued here that uh, perhaps uh, these dichotomies, these binary oppositions may not be very useful uh, in a present that has become uh, quite uh, frankly, uh, very complex. But she also cautioned against uh, forgetting. Uh, that is, uh, we may uh, look towards a future, we may look 
from within the space of the present towards the future, or we may begin to look uh, towards an absolute present, uh, but the present is constantly haunted by, uh, by the past which uh, has not been settled, in other words, whose ghost uh, may remain very ghastly. Uh, so that dystopian and utopian tendencies within South African literature uh, and within African literature globally uh, may in fact be uh, about that ghostly presence uh, or the ghostly presences uh, that uh, perhaps literature may not have started to account for, but which are already discernible in the way in which we read. Because what I see as Ronit's uh, preoccupation here is not simply the way in which uh, uh, writers write, but also the way in which readers read. And her presentation is really about the act of reading, the way in which uh, the reader uh, as reader response theorists have said, half creates uh, what we read. Uh, in other words, half create the, uh, the text uh, that we read. So perhaps it is in that uh, space of reading uh, that uh, the meaning of the present is also very much um, uh, uh, complex. Uh, so how do we, uh, how do we uh, come to terms with, with rapture? How do we come to terms with the break between the past and the present? And of course, uh, my sense is that uh, uh, the idea of haunting, the idea of uh, the ghostly presence of the past uh, is very much part of that question uh, uh, about how we how we deal with rapture, how do we deal with the break, how do we deal with uh, the past and the present, how do we account for uh, the presences uh, of the past within, uh, within uh, the present. Uh, and of course, what, 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 what we may uh, consider, uh, as, as Renit has, has suggested, uh, is the question of, of haunting. And I, I think that, that is, uh, that's an important question. In fact, uh, the, the novel that I'm reading uh, at the moment is called uh, Scatterlings, and it deals precisely with uh, the ghost of uh, the old cape. It returns to 1927 when the first Immorality Act was passed uh, in the cape not the 1950 Morality Act that was passed by the apartheid parliament, but one that was passed by union government in 1927. And that's where the novel begins. And one cannot ask of novels to begin anywhere but where they begin. And that is precisely where I think that this talk uh, has generated uh, interest, uh, at least in the way in which I consider uh, uh, one uh, to be engaged uh, in the movements uh, of African uh, and South African literature. And so uh, when we talk about uh, time in relation to space, uh, we are also talking about the way in which uh, contemporary South African literature, as Ranit has pointed out, is beginning to trace those networks that I spoke about earlier uh, uh, between South Africa and uh, the rest of the global world. Uh, Mosele, for example, uh, Mosele's Pleasure, as Aixim does, Rachel Blue, uh, Rachel's Blue, uh, Bukas's work, which is uh, now being, well, one of which is now being made into a film, uh, be becomes part of the way in which uh, South Africa gets back on the map because uh, after 1994, South Africa uh, was taken off the global map. At, at least uh, in the way in which uh, it was on the global map uh, for a very long time uh, with, with the exiles uh, uh, going uh, to, uh, uh, to the West. Now, a key word, another key word, and I, I'm, I'm picking uh, key words as I wish because uh, there were not just the few that she mentioned, but there were many others. Uh, and the other key word is secretary, and I'm interested in that, in that term for, for one simple reason, uh, that again, it speaks about uh, what may uh, be secular in the way in which writers are beginning to see uh, their own location uh, as not the only one, as, as, as a global location. And in, in other words, the way in which uh, South African writing uh, is, begin, is, is becoming global again, but for different reasons, is becoming global uh, in order uh, to shape discourse elsewhere. Uh, and I'm reminded here of the way in which uh, South African music is, is becoming global, and global not in terms of uh, the North or any other place at all, but in terms of uh, 
uh, what it is doing, what is, it is generating uh, from within itself. Uh, songs like Jerusalem, for example, and so on. Uh, mark a, a, a different uh, sense of, of globality, a different sense of uh, being in the world. Uh, and I think that that connection, uh, that cultural connection, uh, which is a departure from the older forms of globalization, uh, which were north-south, uh, which were moving in one direction, is very important, uh, I think, uh, as part, of, uh, our, uh, as part of, uh, of how we understand uh, South African literature, but also uh, the movements uh, of, of, of cultural capital. So I'm interested in the way in which, uh, for example, uh, Renit spoke about, uh, the, you know, not just you know, the cultural movements, but also the material uh, uh, conditions that shape that cultural movement, that it is not just uh, you know, a culturalist uh, sense that we must develop in, in encountering South African literature and literature globally, but it must also be a materialist uh, conception. And in this sense, she brought to uh, her discussion, the idea of context. And I know my colleague uh, will always say, uh, without context, we cannot really uh, accept this proposal. <laughs> and, uh, and that is, in my view, the way in which uh, uh, you know, we, we, we begin to understand uh, the location of, of culture, the location of, uh, of, of literature uh, in, uh, in, in a context uh, in which uh, it operates, but also not uh, the context in which it operates, but also the context which that literature operates, which, uh, which it brings about, uh, because literature is not just subject to the place in which and the time in which uh, it is produced, but it, is, it also produces time. It invents time. It invents spaces. And that is very important because uh, what happens then is that when we begin to understand uh, a term such as post-apartheid or post-colonial, in other words, what do we mean? Uh, do we mean after? Uh, does post mean after or does it mean when it is coupled with such terms as colonialism, post-apartheid, or does it mean in the wake of apartheid, in the wake of colonialism, not just after these times? And Ronit's argument was that South African literature, as literature elsewhere, is caught in that uh, impossibility of a dichotomy between the past and the present, because post, uh, in this sense, does not really mean after, but that uh, interregnum, if you like, that be in between space between the present and the past. And she then introduced the idea uh, which comes from Tandon Giovanni's uh, argument about uh, post-apartheid South Africa as in fact post-traumatic. And I think that for me, uh, if one follows the arguments about trauma, one begins to understand that trauma is not just material but it is also deeply psychological. And I think South African literature has gone into that dark place. Uh, and it, it remains there, I think. But that dark place is not, as Ronit has argued, dystopian. It is also utopian because it promises. It's a, it's, it, dystopia is indeed a, a product of utopia. It is a deeply human uh, um, uh, a, a, psych a deeply human uh, a sense of, of affect of, 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 uh, of, of, of our um, uh, of our creaturely life. In other words, it, it is bound up with our creaturely life. It is not simply theoretical, but it is also the way in which, as humans, uh, we live. And in that sense, I think what, uh, from my reading uh, of the aesthetics, in other words, of the aesthetics of what uh, Renit spoke about, is that uh, there, there couldn't be a separation between theory and practice, between the body uh, and that which uh, speaks of it, that the body is deeply embedded in the ways in which we talk about what is human about us. And so Marikana becomes that moment it may not have been as big as she, as Renit has pointed out, spectacular as the murders that happened before it, but it becomes that watershed moment, if you like, that questions our humanity, our our ability to uh, to be uh, to be human, to be uh, to be uh, creatures, and therefore uh, we return, as she did, uh, to Njabulan Debele's arguments about uh, understanding, uh, understanding our 
uh, ordinary lives uh, instead of pamphleteering them off, uh, instead of uh, uh, spectacularizing them. And of course, Ndebele's argument is that uh, it is the sloganeering uh, that uh, uh, simply erases uh, the way we respond as creatures that makes us uh, less than human. And Ndebele's uh, recent arguments about how to be human, and I think from uh, Ronit's presentation, I picked up that idea that uh, perhaps uh, South African writing, and not perhaps, but in my experience of it, South African writing has always been involved with the question of, of humanity. I can think here of Louis Ngoss's work in Mating Birds. I could think of uh, South African literature generally, and I could think of Steve Biko's own writing. Uh, South African writing uh, during apartheid and post-apartheid uh, has always already, and has, sorry, has always been involved with the question of being human. What does it mean uh, to be human, for example, uh, in, in, in conditions uh, of, of apartheid, of separation? In other words, uh, when, when uh, one sees a sign, uh, for example, in Lewis and Gossi's Mating Birds, one sees a sign uh, uh, for, for whites only, a bathing area for whites only, how does one interpret that uh, uh, that uh, kind of administrative uh, murder, because it is, in a sense, a killing of sorts. Uh, and uh, Adorno speaks in, 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 in that uh, uh, chapter that I spoke about, uh, about Nazism, not just as uh, a militarization uh, of a country, but also uh, a, not just a, mi a military uh, murder of people, uh, but also an administrative murder of people and I believe that apartheid was more than what we saw, the spectacle, but was also about uh, the, the, the undramatic deaths of those uh, under whom, uh, of those uh, uh, who, whose death were not accounted for, in other words, uh, whose deaths were simply uh, chalked up to administration. So how do we then uh, begin to understand the present as not Manichaean in the sense in which uh, apartheid uh, formulated uh, identity as black, white, or black or white, uh, or black and, and other, or non-white? In other words, how do we account for new ways of conceptualizing uh, identity uh, within uh, the space of humanity, with the sp within the space of, of humanism, if humanism itself is tainted with the blood of its own, uh, of its own times. Uh, in other words, the movement of the concept of humanism uh, has always been a, a, a problematic movement. And we can, if we trace uh, uh, literature globally, uh, we, we can uh, speak, for example, um, of a novel such as Heart of Darkness, which in 1899 was speaking about uh, enlightenment and speaking about humanity and the civilizing mission. But how do we speak of uh, the human today, uh, and how, uh, how do our literature speak of the human today uh, if uh, for a long time the, uh, speaking about uh, the human has been uh, influenced by the spectacular nature uh, of, uh, of, of, of um, representation, of literary representation. We speak of the human, as Ronit has argued, in terms of uh, uh, those atomic ways in which uh, humans exist. Uh, for example, that they exist uh, sexually, they exist racially, they ex and how do we find a discourse uh, to speak about uh, the ways in which we identify? How, in other words, how do we speak about uh, those things in between, for example, men and women, uh, between black black and white, and so on and so forth. How do we speak about those? And we turn, as she did uh, in her first book, uh, to that literature which probes uh, the in-between, that literature which is unsettled, uh, that literature uh, which explores transformations in the ways in which uh, we, we talk about ourselves. And so, uh, as she argues, the present is no longer transitioning. The present is just what it is, the present. The present. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Professor Camila Naidu, and thanks, Professor Mgadi. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are now nearing the end of our proceedings here this evening. Um, let me end by saying, uh, on behalf of the Vice Chancellor, the Management Executive Committee of the University, the Executive Leadership, and each and every member of the University of Johannesburg community, we would like to congratulate you, Professor Frankel, on this momentous occasion, and we wish you all of the best on the rest of your journey going forward. In my mother's language, which is Setswana, we say that it translates, he who guides me in the darkness of the night, I will thank in the light of the dawn. I have no doubt that when the dawn does break, there will be many voices to thank you. Thank you. Bye, Danki. Kealeboha. Ndealeboha. Dorosha, da.